Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm the International Pharmacy Students Federation representative here, and I'm the secretary. And it's my pleasure to welcome the speakers and welcome all of you here today to talk about how we can be equipped to tackle the next pandemic. So firstly, I'd like to introduce the speakers. So we have Dr. Gerald Roshenschau, who's a medical doctor with a medical degree from the University of Graz in Austria. As regional emergency director, he is coordinating WHO's work on emergencies, supporting member states in their efforts to build sustainable prevention, preparedness, response, recovery capacities to strengthen health system resilience. Um, secondly, we have Anja Salku. Anja Salku is an Albanian youth delegate to the UN. Youth delegates to the UN helped to implement the Let's Talk About Mental Health campaign, a youth-focused initiative run in six cities to have honest conversations about mental health. It was done in collaboration with the UN Association and the WHO country office in Albania. Thirdly, we have Ravi. Um, Ravi, is, um, Ravi Shina is currently the project manager for the infodemic management at WHO Europe. Over the last three years, he's been designing and leading various large-scale research projects using social data intelligence in the public health and public policy space with specific focus on identifying misinformation narratives. He's contributed to research featured in publications like Politico, Washington Post, Next Billion, Forbes, and more. And then fourthly, we also have the, um, so we have Sophie Gepp, who is on Zoom with us today, and she's a board member at the German Alliance on Climate Change and Health. She holds an MSci Public Health and is currently pursuing her medical doctorate in the research group on climate change and health at charity Universitat Medicin Berlin and the Potsdam Institute for the Climate Impact Research. She has experience in global and planetary health policy and has been a consultant for international organizations on climate change and health. So thank you to all the speakers here today and we look forward to a fruitful discussion. So my first question is for Dr. Gerald. And the question is, what role can youth play in an emergency and how can they be involved in emergency preparedness for the next emergency? Over to you. Thanks, thanks, Daniel. And, and let me perhaps uh, start uh, with saying uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be back here in Albania, Tirana. I had the pleasure to work here and, and had to leave uh, around one year ago to take my new position in, in Copenhagen overseeing the emergency program of, of, of the European region. And in that context, obviously, uh, if, when I started, uh, the Ukraine crisis uh, started to evolve and you can imagine that, you know, a war in, in, in the center of Europe and the health implications, the displacement uh, are taking most of our attention these days. Unfortunately, we also still have the pandemic going on. And uh, I just, you know, have here some, some recent figures. Uh, one is that, you know, we just had the day 1000 uh, that we activated the incident management support team to manage this global emergency at the regional level, which is convening all the resources in the house to make sure that all the resources uh, are devoted uh, and, and mobilized to, to address the health consequences there. And we saw so far 260 million cases in, in the WHO European region and more than 2 million deaths. I just wanted to make the point here that this is unfortunately not yet over, despite the fact that, you know, we, we want to believe that uh, we are beyond this and we're certainly going in the right direction. But, but let's be clear, there is still the option that we might see new variants of concern. So we need to maintain our readiness. The good thing is that we have uh, new immunity levels. Most of many of us got, got vaccinated. Uh, so I think we're in a much better position now. A third point, we also have monkeypox that was also declared a public health emergency of international concern. Also a very interesting experience, by the way, also in the youth perspective, because it was a, a, a really challenging undertaking to take the right risk communication and community engagement lines, learning a lot from the HIV, uh, the AIDS uh, intervention.
conventions and, and, and translate the lessons learned. I just wanted to make maybe a few points on the lessons learned from the pandemic because you ask what, what youth can do. Well, I think what we learned from, from that pandemic is that even countries who were perceiving that they have well-established and well-resourced health systems really struggled and, and, and failed eventually to, to address the challenges of the pandemic. Uh, we saw a lack of solidarity going back to national egoism. Uh, and I think we completely underestimated the fallout of the public health uh, safety measures that we put in place, particularly on youth. I mean, I, I have my own daughter and I was working in, in, in Palestine in the occupied Palestinian territories uh, during, during the pandemic. I mean, her, her whole university life was basically ruined. Uh, no, no graduation ceremony, no, no networking. So I think those are, are really implications that, you know, go to the heart of what is usually uh, a young life and, and what tend to be some of the highlights, obviously, then with all the mental health and, and psychosocial implications. And, and I think we only gradually grasp the, the magnitude of, of the challenge that, that we have. I mean, those are some of the lessons. What, what are we at the moment or what are we trying to do? I mean, one of the lessons was also that the international global architecture wasn't fit for purpose to, to address that. There was a lot of uh, inequity issues when it comes to vaccine distributions. Uh, you know, mostly rich countries benefited from that in the beginning and less resource countries fell between the cracks. Yes, there were international initiatives like the COVAX uh, initiative that, you know, kicked in, but, but didn't quite meet the expectations there. So what at the moment is ongoing is a, a global discussion. You might have heard from the intergovernmental negotiating body, which uh, is a, a global undertaking to try to come up with a global international instrument uh, treaty and I think it's very important that young voices are engaged in that debate that we really include the perspective of young people because I mean that's going to be an instrument that is basically going to, to shape the future that is going to determine what are the global arrangements and the regional arrangements that will help us manage future emergencies and, and crises. We also see that at the regional level, I mean, the EU is reshaping uh, their architecture. We uh, just, uh, the day before yesterday, a new EU legislation on cross-border health threats was, was adapted with uh, new arrangements also, I mean, new institutions, the HERA, the Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority that is meant to coordinate with EU countries the procurement of medical countermeasures, vaccines, treatments, and so forth. The point I wanted to make, really be engaged, help us to shape that global and regional architecture to be more fit for purpose uh, in the future, to be more sustainable, to be more equitable, and to help us to address future emergencies. And by the way, I think we need, and that's my last point, we need to look beyond pandemics because it's not clear that the next emergency will again be a pandemic. We have other climate change related health threats, we have floods, we have earthquakes. So I think we need to take a comprehensive and all hazards approach. And I think one key message also, this cannot be the exclusive business of the Ministry of Health. It requires an all of government approach. It requires an all of society approach. And there is where youth come in again, very important. Youth, uh, young people are often the educators of the older generation to make sure that, you know, science uh, prevails and, and that miscommunication, misinformation is addressed in, in moving forward. So we count on you. We need you in, in order to, to shape that future architecture and hopefully let's work together that uh, we are better prepared in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for that insight, Dr. Rochenschau. And next we have Anja Savku, youth representative from Albania. And my question to you is, what were the main impacts from COVID-19 on youth in your country? And how did health authorities in your country um, address these impacts. Thank you. 
Thank you, Daniel. And thank you, everyone, for joining us after lunch. I know that we're all a bit you know, sleepy. It's the food coma that's hitting in. I totally understand. Um, OK, regarding to uh, the way that the pandemic hit the youth, I, I hope I'm not just talking for myself, but it did not feel like the pandemic lasted a lot in Albania, per se. Like when I talk with my international friends and I, I told them that like our isolation only lasted for like three to four months, they always look at me like super surprised and they're like, how is that possible? And we were just discussing with Ravi that, uh, you know, when, it, when the, the pandemic lifted up since 2020, but yet I don't say this as a way to, you know, devalue the impact that I do believe the pandemic had on young people, especially that four month period of isolation it was hard. It was hard, especially hitting your mental health and especially because we just had gone through a really disastrous earthquake too. So it was like one big issue after another. And as I was, I was a senior in high school and I had to take my senior exams, matura exams, which, you know, if it's anyone from my generation knows how stressful those months were, that the transition between, you know, going from school to like physically to digitally was absolutely hard when you did not feel like you had the enough support and I'm sure that I talk of this for everyone when I say this but you know staying in the four, wheel, four walls of your house with your family for a long prolonged time well you know it's not the most fun thing despite how much you might love people it, they get on your nerves a lot and especially when you're a teenager and you need your privacy I'm glad that my parents respected my privacy but there is so much privacy you can respect when you're four months continuously on home. So that was even harder, you know, and, and what was harder is that you don't have a lot of mental health discussions in Albania. And I think it comes like, I was talking in the first session about that being an open secret here, but it's definitely really, really hard to, 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 to talk about it because you, you don't feel like, you don't know how to talk about it. It's not a pleasant, you know, conversation to open up at the dinner table like, hey mom, I really suffer from like bad anxiety attacks when I, I want to take like an exam or like, hey dad, I feel like, you know, lately everything looks so bleak and I don't feel like I can do this anymore. So this hard conversations, which are really structural and really essential, and sometimes it's hard to make them with your family members because you know they're not professional they're not health professionals you don't know if they can help you so to 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 young people in albania i think it was really a hard time for a couple of reasons like the, the like online classes i don't think anyone enjoyed those i don't know if i'm talking personally or not but like to me it felt it took all the fun out of school out of like you know connections and there was also the added element of you know added mental health pressure and i'm sure it was so much worse for people who are stuck in abusive homes and for young people that are from lgbtq plus communities and even people that don't have a home, like young people who are in unstable housing conditions. I think all of those really highly affected in the way that we perceive and the way that we lived the pandemic, which is still ongoing, despite it often feeling at times like it's over, at least for us that, you know, the restrictions have been lifted a long time ago. In regards to what the health, um, uh, you know, infrastructure is that, we, we actually have a really cool online platform, which is Nukia Vetum. In, in English, it means you're not alone. Big uh, Eye, which is supported by UNICEF. Uh, but it's, again, you have to see how much it's, you know, how much is in the awareness of young people. And I don't know if anyone here is, who is from Albania and who is Albanian has heard, has heard about Nukia Vetum Big Eye. Like, if you have heard about it, please raise your hand. Okay, we have some good amount of hands here, but still, like, not enough. Uh, but that was one. Also, mental health hotlines are a thing. Like, have you heard that we have mental health hotlines in Albania? You can raise your hands. Yes, yes, okay. Have you tried any of those mental health hotlines if you feel comfortable with sharing? Okay zero answers so i guess that goes to show that the number it, it's really hard and sometimes you don't know if they're functional well enough or not so we have some solutions which i think we should push forward to but at the same time is worth considering if they are enough if they're functional and the most important thing is for the next pandemic 
what I would wish for, what I would really, really wish for, is for young people to be, you know, actively involved in those policy-making spheres for the preparation for the health emergencies, and young people to be actively involved in creating safe spaces for other young people who might be suffering. I, I know that my favorite times when I was in the pandemic was when I was playing with my friends' online games. Like, how many of you have played with your friends' online games during the pandemic? Come on, raise your hands, don't be shy. I think that was really a good, good way of of you know having fun and and kind of elevating that stress that you get from being in home all day with people who are your family so if we can have that fun that we take from the online gaming spaces and turn it into healthy safe spaces where we can communicate when we feel lonely or we, we don't feel good enough or we don't feel well enough i think that's that's a good step for the next pandemic in a personal and in a young level, which is here I'm to represent. For the policy level, well, I'm not there yet, so I will leave the experts to talk about it. But what I would like to see as a young person is, you know, we're good. We're really good. We can do, you know, whatever adults can do, we can do in a more cool, creative way. I'm sorry, but, but it's the truth. So if, you know, you inc not only include us, I'm not asking you, I'm demanding you. If you include us in there and to see those things, I think we can all so much gain from it. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your input there, Anya. It's really great having the youth representation on the panel. Uh, my next question is for Ravi Shina, the Project Manager, Infodemic Management, WHO Europe. And my question is, what is an infodemic and how can youth be involved in promoting health and digital literacy? Thanks, Daniel. Hello, everyone. Uh, before I get into answering what's an infodemic, here's a question for all of you to consider. Anya just mentioned something about a food coma. So Anya just mentioned about a food coma. How many of you know if it's real science or is it just something that we all believe is true? I don't know the answer, but something to think about. So what's an infodemic? At WHO, we define an infodemic as a flow of information with four key attributes. Number one, there is an oversupply of information. Number two, this flow can contain false or misleading information. Number three, this false information can be caused by deliberate actors or could also be unintentional. Finally, infodemics can happen in both online and offline settings. So in summary, an infodemic is too much information, some of which could be false in both online and offline settings. So why do we need to care about infodemics? Why are we here? Why are we talking about infodemics? So infodemics have a lot of negative consequences. Infodemics cause confusion and they result in risk-taking behaviors. Infodemics also lead to mistrust in health authorities and undermine public health response. All of this leads to negative health outcomes and could also lead to intensifying and lengthening of disease outbreaks. Finally, very importantly, or most importantly, misinformation costs lives and promotes hate speech and also leads to societal polarization that we've all seen and experienced in different ways. So to put all of this in context, an example would be to consider the case of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. This is the first pandemic in history where technology and social media are used on a massive scale, probably the biggest scale ever, to keep people safe, to keep people informed, to keep people productive, and also connected. However, at the same time, all of this technology that we rely on every day also enables and amplifies an infodemic that continues to undermine the global response to the pandemic. At WHO Europe, my infodemic management team systematically applies risk and evidence-based analyses to manage infodemics and reduce the impact on negative impact on health behaviors. Is that a
Thank you very much. Have you finished the, the second part? Yeah. Um, and can I just ask then, in regards to that, how can young people be involved in promoting health and digital literacy? Thank you. Uh, so role of youth in infodemic management, right? So let's take a step back to quickly recap what do we mean by health literacy? Health literacy is the ability to understand, to communicate, and use health information to function effectively within a health system. So having good health literacy skills can help youth get information and health services when they need it. Youth can be more involved to promote health and digital literacy across three major dimensions. The first one is the functional dimension. So what do we mean by functional dimension? Youth can research and apply information relating to knowledge and services to respond to a health-related question. If somebody asks you a question, you have the information to respond to it in an appropriate way. Uh, the second one is the interactive dimension. This requires more knowledge, more understanding, and better skills to actively and independently engage with the health issue and to apply new information in changing circumstances. And finally, the last one is the critical dimension. And this is very important in my opinion. Youth should also develop the ability to selectively access and critically analyze health information from a variety of sources to take action to promote personal health and well-being or that of others. So we will explore some of these skills in the upcoming workshop right after this session on in misinformation. So looking forward to having you all there. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. And we now have Sophie Gepp. I believe she's on Zoom. And my question for you, Sophie, is um, how can lessons learned during the COVID pandemic drive the climate crisis forward to an end? And where do you see youth's role in this? Hi, everyone. Uh, so nice to see you. I hope you can hear and see me. Um, yeah, I'm really, thank you very much, Daniel, and I'm happy to join remotely. Um, and I'll give a brief overview, and I know that you will go more into depth in the session later that I can't join, unfortunately, but I, I hope, um, yeah, um, that you will um, then have a good exchange and a good workshop. So one thing, one really important thing that we saw during the COVID-19 crisis that we're still seeing is that crisis, health crises worsen inequalities and injustice and are in turn also influenced by this. So whether it be gender, racialized and marginalized communities, poor communities, um, both in lo on local and on global scale, um, these do affect crisis and the way crisis hits. And the same is true for the climate crisis. So while it affects us all, we know this, it affects us now, it will get, um, the impacts will be bigger in the future, will be stronger felt. Um, it does not affect everyone in the same way. And this underlines the importance of all the work on the determinants of health and on building healthy societies. But it also, and this was also mentioned before um, on the panel, the importance of responding to crisis in solidarity and, and in a just manner. Um, and this is really, really crucial to the context of climate change and to all the debates happening um, in, the, in the context of climate change and climate policy. One other thing that it showed, shows us <clears throat> is that, th that we have to rethink prevention, that we have to refocus and rethink uh, pre 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 prevention. Uh, and a big question is where does prevention start? Um, and if we look really, really, really at the start of it, um, one of the best preventions you can do is not to overstep planetary boundaries, which increases the risk for pandemics. So the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services um, stated that the majority of emerging diseases are zoonosis, um, and these spill over due to contact among wildlife, livestock, and people. And the way we um, live, uh, like the land use change, agricultural expansion, and urbanization causes more than 30% of uh, emerging disease events. And so reducing anthropogenic global environmental change may reduce pandemic risk. And on the other hand, we know that a recent paper just came out that, that stated that over half of known human pathogenic diseases can be aggravated by climate change. So the, the, and, and it also stated that the pathways and the 
um, hazards are too numerous for comprehensive ad adaptation and highlight again the need for working on the source of the problem for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So both um, the way biodiversity and climate change, um, we are overstepping these planetary boundaries is impacting the risk for future pandemics um, while being in itself a crisis already. And so new instruments for pandemic uh, prevention and response should include this kind of um, prevention to really make sure we start at the source of the problem um, and reduce biodiversity loss and habitat destruction as much, much as possible. Um, and we know that healthy recovery and healthy societies will only be possible in context of planetary boundaries. And also the struggling of health systems has been mentioned. So we, we have seen in COVID that health systems have been really struggling a lot. They're still start struggling. And on the other hand, we see the impacts of, of climate change, which pose an enormous challenge for health systems. So we need climate resilient uh, health systems and also climate neutral health systems that doesn't, don't further um, aggravate the problem. Uh, and so there we really need, after strong commitments we had in the past year at COP26, we really need implementation in the context of climate resilient and climate neutral health systems. Um, this is especially especially tricky when we're dealing with multiple crises at once. But we have to we have to do two things. We have to act at the with the needed speed and scale. We know that the window of opportunity is there, but it's narrow and it's uh, rapidly closing to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. Um, so we need anticipatory global action on adaptation and mitigation. And we also know that we can't treat one crisis at the time. We have multiple crises, multiple health crises, and we have to be very careful not to roll back on climate friendly policies in the context of other crises, because we, we can't just treat one crisis at the time. If you have a patient that has multiple diseases that could po be potentially life-threatening, you can't just uh, treat one of them. And just uh, today, the Lancet countdown came out and, and stated that the health of people around the world is at the mercy of persistent fossil fuel addiction. And so this is very clear about the science, what we have to do. We have to add at the speed and scale that is needed for that. And how how are young people involved? Um, I think the big question is how how are they not? How could they not? Um, this is affecting their present. This is affecting their future. A lot of the uh, people are already involved in movements and in solutions uh, around climate justice and see it very clearly because this to them is is um, actually the livability of the planet they're going to live on. And so the main thing is they have to be listened to. They have to be involved in policy inclusion. And I think we all owe it to, <laughs> to, to, to current and future generations to conserve the livability of our planet and to act quick enough because we, there's very little, like we can't do it with incremental change anymore. We have to really step up um, for prevention and for the livability of the planet. Um, to safeguard health in the future. So, yeah, I think young people at the center, they, they are already working a lot of it because they want to, but also because they have to, because they know there's no way around it. Um, and this can be quite challenging, talking about mental health. Um, and so I hope that in the workshop you can further explore how, how young people can be involved, but it's also up to policymakers to involve them. It's not only up to young people to try to be involved there. There's already so much happening, so much movements, so much demanding. Um, and I think there's there's still time. Uh, every degree, every fraction of a degree counts, but um, the speed and the scale has to really match the challenge, and that's currently not yet happening. And I hope to see um, like more ambition and more implementation um, <clears throat> and young people being included in that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie, for that. And we have a couple of minutes left, so I was going to ask whether the panel were happy to do final remarks, 30 seconds of just key messages that you'd like the young people in the audience and watching at home just to take away from this. I'll start with yourself. Well, I, you know, I'm just encouraged by, by the engagement and, and the really strong arguments by Sophie and others on the panel here. So I think we need to do that collectively and, and young people have a major role to play in shaping the future in the right way, be it climate change, be it pandemics. We are in the process of reshaping the global architecture. That's your future and, and that's where we really need the major input from your side. 
Well, 30 seconds is, wow, okay, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. But to me is that, uh, so we live in a world that is so scary. Like, I'll just say it like outright. There are so many things going on and it seems that it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And being a young person, like having, and people asking you, hey, like what you're gonna do in the future? And you're like, oh, but are we gonna have a future? Like, is it is it is it like possible to do that? Is really outright scary. And you know what's scarier? is that we're not being listened to like the, the, and imagine being in that desperate situation that many young people who don't have a voice who are not me like are in that situation and and you want to yell but you can't yell because no one is listening to you i think that's scarier too so i don't have a message per se i just have that we're desperate we are desperate and if you're not hearing us in that moment that we are feeling so desperate then I don't think anything that I'm going to say or people are going to say are going to hit on. Like, I'm scared for my future. I'm scared because like, and, and climate change and all these other issues affect on my mental health. And I'm scared to live in a world that I don't know how it's going to look like. And I'm scared that people are not collaborating with each other and they refuse to see one thing that we all have in common, which is our humanity. We are living in a world where people continue to dehumanize each other. And that's what's more scary to me is that we've lost the goal. We've lost the count. Like what, what, what matters for the development and technology if you can treat your neighbor like a human? And that's to me what's the most scary about and what I want to strive is like other than the big, big world problems that like, like we all feel like the Gen Z's and I know that there are a lot of Gen Z's here and everyone here feels, you know, it's our obligation to solve and want to do that. Other than that, I feel just like it's very simple, like, in a personal level, I want us humans to try to start treating each other like humans, like, really easy, really simple as that. And it starts just with, you know, being humanizing, being sympathetic, being empathetic with the struggles and the issues, and being heard and involved, not just heard, but involved. So thank you. And Ravi? That was great. I really can't follow <laughs> follow that up with anything else. But just to say, please attend the session on misinformation. There's a lot more to discuss there. And it's, it's a very critical topic. And if there's one request I can make to everybody is please be very mindful when you're partaking in information sharing, whether as a consumer or as a person who's forwarding things on. Just don't participate in it in a reckless manner. Please be conscious. That's, that's the only message I'd like to leave here. And Sophie, over to you. Um, yes, I don't have much to add. Um, um, just the science is very clear. The demands of movements have been very clear. There are solutions out there. Um, we have to stop harming our health and the planet. And I think there is really no way around if we want to safeguard health and if we want to preserve it, our planet for current and future generations. And so it's time for implementation. So thank you to all the speakers for speaking today. It was a really, really engaging session. I've learned so much myself. I'm sure all of you as an audience would agree with that. Let's give a big round of applause for all the speakers.